Welcome to Dead Man Talking. Tonight's show, we welcome back the incredible Rico stories with another exclusive to the DMT Forest of Fear channel. And as ever, please do let us know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share. Why well, it really does help build the channel and that community further. And why not hashtag Team Fear and DMT's Cryptid Crew. And so, with that aside, let's get into tonight's story. Entitled The Bunker. Let's get straight into that. Prologue. Revenge is a dish best served cold. Part 1. The Diversion. A crescent moon provided little to no light over a dark Romanian forest full of myth and lore. They crept slowly and silently in the shadows of the thick trees, shrouded by special ghillie suits hiding their body heat. The lead man held a device that revealed the locations of the motion sensors. As they reached the top of the rise, an old castle lay ahead of them. But this, well, this was no normal castle, as it bristled with low-level lighting and surveillance cameras. Genetic experiments on blood-borne viruses were believed to be conducted here. Two huge figures suddenly scaled the stone walls undetected and unexpected. And as they reached the top, their enhanced hearing and sense of smell revealed two guards nearby. Two 40mm grenades were launched from the tree line, one towards the rear entrance and the other towards the front. An explosion followed by a blinding light took out the forward sensors as the grenades hit the entrance doors. Alex and Abdul leapt over the ledge and took out the two guards as they quickly breached the roof entrance. The front and rear entrances were simultaneously breached by the 40mm grenades as gunfire rang out and the dogs emerged from behind a smokescreen to rip weapons from two guards and crush their throats with their gaping jaws. The frozen Siberian tundra crunched under their feet as they deliberately made their way under a clear star-filled night. They occasionally stopped and huddled under the snow-white parkers to check for motion sensors or cameras with their own high-tech equipment. The searchlights of the pristine two-story white facility scanned the area, but their IR sensors were confused by the parkers' reflective layer. At the rear, a huge polar bear ambled along, scratching at the ground as if scavenging for food. The camera in the control room paused for just a moment as a security guard documented the bear and continued his scan. A herd of elk trotted towards one side of this big chemical facility believed responsible for the creation of weaponized viruses. The bear was no longer under the viewing area of the cameras when it suddenly stood up to reveal the figure of an extremely large man in a bear costume, and Eric began scaling the wall. As the elk herd trotted next to the far wall, a man released his tether from a large bull and rolled up to the base of the wall. He donned climbing claws, and Hawk shimmied up the walls like a ninja. The Romanian men breached the front and rear entrances with explosives, and the dogs took out guards before they could react. A sprawling new warehouse sat in the middle of the clearing, at the bend of a huge river. The steamy Amazonian jungle seemed to wrap itself around them as they crept methodically towards it, while watching every single step. The heat and humidity made it almost impossible for Fleur to detect a heat signature. A crocodile slowly propelled itself towards the docks of the facility, as the searchlights pound the river. The lights reflected of the reptile's eyes, causing the lights to pause for a second, and then continue its arc. This facility was believed to be the world's foremost location for the creation of enhanced performance drugs. Most of their security apparatus was focused on the cleared area to the front and sides. But no measures were in place for an enhanced human, almost seven feet tall, concealed inside a fake crocodile filled with equipment and explosives. Jamal exited the crocodile suit and pulled out a large waterproof bag, held his breath and swam rapidly towards the dock while the crocodile decoy impacted a wooden swinging gate at the river entrance with an explosion, causing it to fly off of the hinges. Blinding explosions accompanied electronic interference, along with more blasts as the other men fired their weapons and rushed the building. Lars kicked in the huge double doors and the firefight started as the dogs quickly took out the guards. 
Part 2 A Divergence The four story Romanian castle offered almost no resistance as Tim Ross, Sergeant Bill Goodson, Spec Jerome Hooks, and Corporal Ted Brown worked their way down a dark corridor, encountering only four guards who were quickly dispatched. Dogs Cujo and Phoenix ran ahead sniffing out the corridors with the intent of meeting Alex and Abdul at some point. Screams rang out as Tim directed his men to double time to find the source. The dogs had five people cornered in a large laboratory on the third floor as two gunshots rang out directly above. Momentarily, Alex and Abdul emerged having taken out the last of the guards. The lab employees were now huddled in a corner as Cujo and Phoenix snarled at them. Tim stepped between the dogs as the huge frames of Alex and Abdul flanked him. And Tim said, Looks like we have a captive audience here. Question is, will you talk, or do the dogs need to take a little bite? And the lead scientist, Mr. Singh, began telling them that a week ago, a crew of men came and removed all the test subjects, and all they were doing now was studying the genes under microscopes. Tim pressed them, wanting to know where they took the people, but Mr. Singh and the others swore that they did not know. And Alex said, I sense their honesty, for their fear is palpable. Tim told the lab crew that they'd better cough up some possible locations, or they would be dog food. A woman named Natalia Omarova spoke in her thick accent and said, Not necessary. They took them to the bunker. It is a place called the bunker in Syria. What kind of test subjects? said Jamal. She slowly pointed to a computer screen with winged vampire-like creatures. Oh, Lord, said Tim. Grab what you can, men, and get ready to implode this freak house. We got a split. Our hellos are inbound. Hawk took out a guard on the east side of the second story, while Eric did the same on the west. Eric kicked in the huge metal door on the roof that they swept through clear in the second story. Tank breached the front entrance, followed by Corporal Gomez, while the burly Sergeant Grant and PFC Wood breached the rear. Dog Zeus and Thor were turned loose to clear the building. A brief exchange of gunfire came from above as Hawk and Eric eliminated two long guards. The dogs began to bark and snarl as two guards screamed, We give up! The team converged on a main laboratory to discover several people in white lab coats and with their hands up as the dogs stood only inches from them crouched and ready to pounce. And Hawk spoke up. Tell us what kind of experiments you do here or we will walk out and shut you in here with the dogs. They looked at each other momentarily, when a Dr. Rousseau said, They took them a week ago. They took them all. Eric then said, I am a large man of little patience. Tell us who and where, lest the worst fate befall you. And Dr. Rousseau directed them to a computer terminal, where he brought up videos of what could be best described as men being transformed into werewolves. Where are they now? said Hawk. A place in Syria known only as the Bunker, said Rousseau. Grab these hard drives and start setting charges, said Hawk. This place is coming down. Contact at Chinook for egress. And Hawk paused, looking directly at Rousseau, and asked, Why Syria? They are being prepared for a war, said Rousseau. Hawk directed PFC Roger Wood to send an encrypted message to Akimi, relaying this intel, and that they needed to rally in Israel. Chuck followed Jamal and Sergeant Marcus Jones on his six. Lars and Speck Dobson and Sergeant Ron Haynes similarly took out two guards at the rear entrance. Chuck, Jamal and Jones encountered only minimal resistance from three guards, taking two out with one surrendering. Doug Samson and Beowulf began sniffing out the huge warehouse. It was only a couple of minutes until a woman screamed in a thick Latin accent, saying, Please, don't hurt us. We only work here. Lars dragged the guard in by his collar and deposited him on the floor with a thud. Chuck told the woman to tell everything she knew, or they would be dog food. And she responded, Ah, please, sir. We don't know where they took them. Chuck snapped back, saying, Tell me who is them and who is they. And Miss Vega said, uh, Look here, as she pointed to a computer screen. There were videos of experiments involving humans and reptilians. At least a dozen. Where did they go? Said Chuck, very sternly. I don't know for sure, she said. 
but I think it's Lebanon or Syria. They call this place the Bunker, Jamal said. For what purpose would they take these tortured souls to a war-torn place like this? Miss Vega paused and then said, They are super-soldier experiments that are done here. They are being prepared for war. Chuck looked around and said, Boys, grab up any evidence you can carry and start setting charges. This place is about to burn. Jones keyed up his mic and called for the speedboat extraction. Jones transmitted a message via satellite link to Bukimi, saying mission accomplished. Part 3. All roads lead. Let's get straight into that. It had been two years since decrypted terror attacks on the EU and the USA. The war in Eastern Europe had found the boss on the side of the aggressor, but financial sanctions had also disrupted his ability to manipulate world leaders and the currencies of the countries. But this chink in his armour was about to be exploited. He hadn't given up, though, on his research programmes. However, few knew he had consolidated to a central and more secure facility in Syria. He felt safe and untouchable there. He would soon discover otherwise. He also thought his large wilderness spread in America would be off-limits to the US agencies. The Joint Task Force Chimera, Director Jack Rogers, remained at JTC HQ with Captain Tripp Steele. Leader Chan, Bartholomew, McGregor, a.k.a. Bart and Dog Ronin, along with Marco Penzoni and Dog Attila. Both young men were now six foot eight and six foot nine, respectively, and weighing around 375 to 380 pounds. They would remain in the US with the majority of the cadre, and all would claim that they had no knowledge of clandestine missions against souls. As a matter of fact, they were about to conduct a mission in a cryptid rich area near the northeast Texas Oklahoma border, where Soros had purchased 1,000 acres of wilderness land and built a huge mansion with a state of the art security and what appeared to be a huge warehouse behind it. There was a fleet of vehicles, a helipad, and a 5,000 foot airstrip along with a large security team. The stated purpose of this mission was to investigate elevated and even aggressive cryptid activity in the area. But the real mission was to probe the facility and investigate the warehouses behind it and its contents. After the teams destroyed the three Sobros facilities, they planned to rally to Haifa, Israel, where they would seek the help of Mossad agents whom they worked with in Kandahar. The Mossad had already been tracking the movements around this facility known as the Bunker. They believed the boss was putting together a team of cryptid soldiers to supplant his steroid height mercenaries. The Mossad planned to have a diversionary mission on troop movements followed by an airstrike on a Syrian terrorist camp for the JTC team. Akimi and Lin Song set up a full stock trading company and hacked into Soros International accounts. They spread rumours and false news stories about the destruction of the Soros facilities, saying it was perpetrated by local governments for illegal activity. These stories persuaded thousands of investigators to sell off millions of stock held in his companies, causing a huge sell-off and devaluation. CIA contacts and their operatives circulated rumours with foreign entities that Soros was under investigation by the EU in several countries for crimes against humanity, causing his assets to be frozen in some countries resulting in the U.S. finally following suit. He had lost over $2 billion in a matter of days. It was just before daylight at the Haifa International Airport when Agent Daniel Zoma and Jacob Golan met the group in two large vans. They proceeded to a hangar facility with accommodations for the clandestine team. The agents called a briefing with General Rubin and Colonel Kaplan who were briefed the team on the plan. The team would embed with the Israeli Defense Force troops as they swept towards the border near where Israel, Lebanon and Syria converge. It was to be a routine military exercise and bivouac, which both Syria and Lebanon were accustomed to. Air assets would be on standby and with a stealth drone flying reconnaissance. Recent satellite activity showed both helicopters and large vehicles arriving at this mysterious bunker facility. A steady stream of food, equipment and other supplies have been arriving every day. The layout of the building showed it to be two stories, 
with an underground level and having four entrances. A plan involving a diversion followed by simultaneous breaches was in order. Hawk and Tim called the teams together in a large tent for the brief, and Hawk spoke up and said, Gentlemen, it looks like Saros has created a small army of vampires, werewolves, and reptilians. The purpose is yet unknown. Let's saddle up for a trip. Part 4. A Convergence The IDF troops stopped at the tip of Lake Tiberius to set up a FOB and command center and get some needed rest after a long day's journey. They were now just 30 kilometers from their intended target, a mysterious and fortified place known as the Bunker. They were camped for the night and briefed on the latest intel. The troops needed rest after the long day's travel and would await any overnight fresh intel for use in the final plan. At 0700, the team mustered in a large tent for a mission briefing as Hawk and Tim relayed what they knew to their Israeli counterparts. It was then that Agent Zomar and Golan interrupted a brief, directing their technical assistant to put up some satellite imagery on the screen. Agent Omar announced, Ladies and gentlemen, this is intense. Now the video began with a timestamp of 0215 hours overlooking a small refugee camp. Four armed men stood around a large barrel while a fire burned in it. Suddenly, a large reptile-like creature rushed in from the left, while a canine-like creature being charged from the right. The guards were almost instantly killed in a vicious attack. Muzzle flashes were seen in the periphery as more creatures rushed in. A few people attempted to flee their tents to no avail, and the whole thing was over in less than five minutes. A winged bat creature landed on top of a man who had tried to run. It bit down into his neck and ripped out his throat. Agent Golan held up an envelope marked Top Secret and said, We believe the boss has created a cryptid army for hire, and Syria intends to use them to eliminate his refugee problem. And the JTC team arrived by helicopter in a rural, unincorporated place called Brown Springs, Oklahoma, as dawn crept into the early morning sky. They proceeded on foot to recon the area. A drone would be on station by sunset. The dogs abruptly stopped as Bart and Marco stepped forward to examine some large barefoot human footprints in the ground. They pushed on as the dogs became more and more on edge as Bart proclaimed, Jack, we are being watched. Marco shouted, Duck! As softball and grapefruit-sized rocks, along with tree limbs the size of large fence posts, flew through the air. Two large mouse sasquatches charged them, holding what looked like large tree limbs. The team fired their 458 socums as Bard and Marco drew down with a desert eagle 50 cows. The beast tumbled to a stop only feet away. They had just encountered highly aggressive Sasquatch unlike any seen before. They were dressed in animal skins and had leather straps around their necks with crude pendants. They bore face and head paint and it was very unusual for Sasquatch to use weapons in this way. It was as if they had been taught this. The Alphas believed the rest of the clan was in retreat, for now. The plan was to split up and recon the mansion and warehouse from two sides. Part 5 Dead Reckoning Let's get straight into that. It was now nightfall at the IDF encampment as the troops planned a diversionary attack on a location believed to be a terrorist encampment about 15 kilometers from the bunker. The JTC element was to attack the bunker five minutes after a assault began. Suddenly, a five-man recon team interrupted the briefing by dragging a man in who was bound and tied. He worked at the bunker, and the team had managed to abduct him while on his way home. He told him in Arabic that there were many unhuman creatures there, and he was very frightened and believed that the place was full of jinn that his people feared so much. When asked to describe them and tell their numbers, he began trembling and said, Raju, Azawahif, Masasi, Dima, Diab, Daria, Ammin. He had just said, reptile men, vampires, werewolves, dozens of them. The room was silent as Tim and Hawk wondered if they had enough troops to fight this battle. Harry contacted Akimi and Lin Song 
to see if they could hack into the facility to bring its defences down. She briefed him on how she and Lin Song had caused Soros Group International to lose about one-fourth of its value. The rumours were that the 90-year-old Soros was furious to the point that he had to be admitted to a hospital. It seemed that they were really getting him both financially and personally. Agent Omar made a call and now had a flight of F-15 Strike Eagles on standby just across the border to attack both the bunker and the terrorist encampment. Director Jack Rogers, along with Bart, led their element to the north side and rear side of the compound and took a position about 700 yards away. Two of Sovros's guards ambled about and they fit the bill as the typical mercenaries he employed. They were large men, apparently ripped on steroids, and suddenly Bart motioned for the team to take cover as a small drone approached. After the drone was out of range, the team continued their stealthy trek towards the rear of the compound. A creek ran behind them and made enough noise to conceal their careful movements. And after advancing about 15 to 20 yards, Attila alerted and growled as a loud splash was heard, followed by another as large rocks were thrown from across the creek. Speck Washington pulled out the micro drone and sent it in that direction. Jack quietly made a call to Master Sergeant Tammy Martin back at Fort Campbell to initiate attempts to hack into the compound's computer network. He wanted her to hack into the power grid and shut down the power long enough for his team to take out the generators. Speck Washington motioned for Jack to look at the video feed from the micro drone as IR images of several large humanoid figures slowly shadowed their movements from across the creek. The rock throwing had now stopped but the targets were now at the water's edge barely 50 yards away. Captain Tripp still and Marco proceeded to the southern or main entrance and concealed themselves about 900 yards away. And just as with the north entrance, this entry point had two of Sovros' famous guards, noticeably hyped up on performance enhancing drugs. Suddenly, Marco loudly whispered for the team to low crawl for cover as the drone veered in their direction. The teams concealed themselves as the drone passed over them. It was now obvious that this compound had eyes in the sky in addition to all the surveillance cameras and motion sensors. Jones pulled out the micro drone and readied it for the night ISR. The sun was now completely down and it was almost dark. It was obvious they would have to find a weakness for the teams to probe and exploit. As Tripp and Sergeant Jones quietly discussed some sort of diversion, Ronin bristled and started looking behind them as he sniffed the light air. It was then that two whoops were heard followed by two wood knocks. All the lights of the compound came on, and the searchlight on top of the mansion began making passes. The question was now whether that was routine, or if the whoops and woodknocks had triggered this for some reason. Regardless, it was going to be a long night, but the teams would have to watch their backs, as well as Sovereign's thugs. Part 6. Tribulation. Let's... Get straight into that. On the other side of the world, the clandestine mission was now underway as Hawk and Chuck readied their troops along with the Mossad counterparts. Real-time satellite imagery showed video of movement around the camp and a small convoy approaching on the main road to the bunker. The IDF Special Forces team, the Winged Snakes, slowly advanced on a terrorist camp not 15 kilometers away. Agent Soma and Golan believed that the truck convoy was purpose to take the cryptid super soldiers to a large refugee camp to the north. They waited to assault the camp until after the abominations were loaded onto the trucks. Two high-flying drones would launch their four Maverick missiles at the trucks and the team would take out any survivors. Two F-15s would streak across the border and bomb the bunker or two more bomb the terrorist camp. Omar's radio crackled. Samson's axe, this is Gabriel's sword, awaiting command. Roger, Gabriel Sword. Stand by. Six large trucks pulled up to the bunker's front gate, while four lightly armoured vehicles with machine guns flanked them. Ten hooded figures of varying sizes loaded into each truck, and guards closed the rear doors. The convoy lined up with an armoured vehicle in front, and one placed between every other vehicle, with one at the rear. Agent Omar keyed his mic and spoke one word. Megiddo. The comms crackled with. Gabriel Sword. Roger. Followed by Angel Fire, Roger, inbound. 
To the east, the night sky lit up as the attack on the terrorist encampment began. Hawk gave the command for the team to fire their shoulder-mounted rockets, and the drones high above launched their maverick missiles as the convoy started to roll. Jack Rogers had positioned his men to the rear of the warehouse behind the mansion, awaiting Tammy to shut down the power grid. Two lone men had sneaked up near the fence by the generators, ready to cut the main cables running from the two massive generators when the lights went out. Suddenly, the lights flickered and went out. But as if on cue, five Sasquatch rushed across the creek towards the main element. Jack told his snipers to take out the guards and they braced for an attack from the rear. Jack and Bart squared off against what appeared to be an alpha male charging them. He fired his 458 Sokum as Bart fired his Barrett 50, dropping it only feet away from them. The remaining four Sasquatch flanked each side two by two as they rushed into a hail of bullets. The two team members tasked to cut the power lines and merged firing their Sokums on full auto. One Sasquatch on the left fell and tumbled over two men as the remaining one grabbed a man off the ground about to decapitate him. Before it could snap off his head, Ronin pounced through the air, biting down on the back of its neck. As it spun wildly, trying to break the grip, Bart slid in, severing one of its legs with a massive blue sword. He instantly drew his Desert Eagle 50 and ended the beast with a skull shot. Jack had turned his attention to the other flank, where one Sasquatch was wounded by the stump of a team member. He fired a round into the back of its skull as the remaining cadre killed the other. It was then that five guards poured out of the warehouse, firing automatic weapons. Jack called out to Bart and said, Go back up, Trip. We got this. Captain Trip Steele was now at the tree line, about 300 yards from the front entrance. The ten-foot-high fence surrounded the compound and extended about 100 feet from the epicenter. Two snipers ready to take out the guards as the compound went black. But growling and tree crashing erupted from their six o'clock. And Trip said, Fire! The other guards went down, but the team had to immediately turn their attention to what sounded like several small bulldozers approaching. Sergeant Jones observed seven tangos advancing from his small tablet via the micro drone feed. This was just supposed to be a recon mission to see what was inside the warehouse, but it was about to be a full on war with seven Sasquatch against a team of six. A huge alpha, a huge alpha mount, almost nine feet tall, led the way. As the element opened fire. Marco stood up and faced him from about 50 feet and put a round into his eye socket, dropping it instantly. Usually when an alpha like this was killed, the rest of the clan would either retreat or hesitate, but these, these kept coming. Trip, Jones and another man trained their weapons to the right as Marco and two more turned their attention to the left. Two screams were heard over the deafening gunfire as the Sasquatch overran them. A tiller locked down on the calf of one beast, causing it to scream and turn its attention away from a team member who it stood over. Marco cleaved his blue sword into the side of its neck, severing its spinal cord. But it appeared too late for another team member as the Sasquatch trampled him. Part 7. Twisted. Fates. Let's get straight into that. In the desert, the lead armoured vehicle exited the huge gates and exploded in a ball of flame and flipped over onto its back. The other armoured vehicles took direct hits except for the one in the rear, which suffered an explosion from only three metres away, flattening its tyres as shrapnel killed the driver. Small shoulder-fired rockets struck the cabs of the passenger trucks, triggering a small fireballs as the team advanced in a dead run. Eric, Jamal, Abdul, Alex, Tank and Lars led the pack with their Barrett fifties held at the ready. Chuck and Hawk angled towards the remaining armoured vehicles to eliminate its twin PKM machine guns. And suddenly, the hooded figures began to pour out at the trucks. Some limped, some crawled, and some were on fire from the missile strikes. Several took to the air as the team tossed grenades at the survivors and fired their weapons. Of the thirty or so that charged towards the team, they took out a few, but most advanced. Some ran on all fours, some scampered and darted about to avoid gunfire, and some swooped down from above. This battle was on in a fierce way, as the cryptid soldiers came into close quarter, contact with the troops. Eric and his front-line element were now in hand-to-hand combat with swords drawn, 
as they battled the wolfmen and reptile men up close and personal. Tim Russ led the second element, firing at the Batman with a sword, putting one down and wounding another. The machine gun fire from the PKPs was suddenly silenced as Hawk and Chuck had thrown grenades under the vehicle's fuel tanks, causing it to erupt into a fireball. The second flank of the team was now suffering attacks from the bat-like creatures that circled from behind and attacked swiftly, inflicting deep wounds by slashing their long claws. Several of the reptile and wolfmen now attacked from the flanks. Chuck and Hawk approached from the left, firing their 458 Sokums. Agent Omar and Golan advanced from the right, firing their Tavo 308 automatics at both creatures in the air and on the ground. Chuck shouted to Hawk and said, Is it just me or does this remind you of Oak Ridge? And Hawk nodded as they engaged the cryptids. Brown Springs Bart rushed out of the bush, firing his Barrett 50, as Ronin ran towards a Sasquatch that stood over a down team member. One beast went down from the 50 cal fire to the head, and Ronin locked onto the crotch of another as it roared and grabbed the dog by its neck. Just as it started to twist the dog's head off, Attila locked on to its wrist, causing it to let go of Ronin long enough for the massive dog's jaws to rip a part of the Sasquatch's face off. Bart and Marco now backed up the rest of the team firing at Desert Eagle 50s into the backs of the Sasquatch's heads. The two beasts that remained standing faced off against Bart and Marco. They holstered their pistols and drew their giant swords. The Sasquatch froze and stared at the pale lights reflecting off of the blades. And for an instant, it was as if they were mesmerized, but this would prove to be a deadly mistake for these primitive beasts. The Alphas charged the beast slashing and ducking, and sidestepping as the beast tried to grab them. As Bart and Marco squared off with them again, Ronin and Attila attacked from behind, clamping down onto the calves of the Sasquatch. As they roared in pain and turned their attention away, Bart and Marco launched forward and beheaded the beasts, and they fell to the ground with a large thud. They rushed and tended the injuries of one man who suffered several rib fractures and internal bleeding. Now all that remains was the sporadic gunfire from the warehouse, and they readied to secure the mansion. Jack had one dead and another wounded as he and Speck Washington tried to flank the remaining three mercenaries. Corporal Banks and Sergeant Goodson laid down cover fire long enough for Jack to toss two grenades silencing one of the guards. But now, automatic gunfire commenced from the warehouse doorway, causing the team to pancake and low crawl for cover. The two remaining guards outside tried to make a run for the warehouse door one was hit by a burst from a Sokum, putting him down. The other guard narrowly made it through the door. Tripp and Sergeant Jones arrived to back up the troops, and as the gunfire paused for a moment, Jack shouted, Lay down your weapons and come out! You're surrounded! And there was silence for a moment, and a voice was heard to say, We surrender! Don't shoot! We coming out! Two men emerged from the doorway, carrying a third who was seriously wounded. They laid the man down, went to their knees, and placed their hands over their heads. While four team members secured the mansion, Jack and Tripp began searching the warehouse. They found refrigeration units containing boxes with vials of liquid and small glass containers of what appeared to be blood and tissue. At that point, Sergeant Jones drug a small Asian man through the door who was hiding in the mansion. And Jones said, Captain, this is Dr. Chang, and he has something to say. Ah, go ahead. I was hired by SGI to maintain the genetic material. Please don't hurt me. I'll cooperate. Akimi and Lin Song sat in their control room in Haifa, scrambling to get clearance for the US Global Hawk drone on station at 30,000 feet to fire its Maverick missiles. But drone footage now showed that the fighting was at close quarters and a missile strike was no longer an option. Eric was locked into a pitched battle with two wolfmen, when a six-foot-four Sergeant Grant grabbed one from behind and ran his tack knife up through its neck as he held it off the ground. Eric quickly slammed the other one to the ground and snapped its neck. He gave Grant a quick smile and said, huh, I think you are one of us. Alex and Abdul had emptied their weapons and now used their swords to engage several reptile men. Beowulf latched onto one long enough for Lars to behead it. Abdul impaled another as Alex grabbed the bat-like creature from the air, in mid-flight slamming it to the ground. 
tank looked like a bulldozer as he rammed a werewolf and a reptile into the side of one of the wrecked trucks. Thor jumped the wolf, biting down on its face as Tank rammed his large tack knife into the reptile's throat. As Tim lay on his back, defending against the slashes of a wolfman, Jamal snatched it off of him and broke its neck. Brown, Gomez and Wood stood back to back, firing up pistols as they expended their rifle ammo. Hawk, Chuck, along with Agents Omar and Golan, were also down to their pistols now. And Eric shouted over comms, Cover your ears! Deploying sonic weapon! The piercing train whistle-like sound began as the team covered their ears while each alpha pointed their miniature sound wave machines in all directions. First of all were the remaining bats who instantly fell to the ground screeching in pain. The wolves and reptiles rolled across the ground in agony covering their ears. The sound stopped just long enough for Agents Omar and Golan to start shouting. Fall back! Inbound! The troops ran for the rise in the hillside, hoping to jump over as the F-15s dropped their ordnance with a loud explosion, followed by searing heat. Part 8. A closure of sorts. Let's get straight into that. A busy whirlwind of battle was now over as the bunker lay in ruins, and the remaining chimeras were either dispatched or surrendered. Some simply begged for mercy, while others asked to join JTC for an opportunity to get revenge on their cruel masters. They all wore a type of electronic shock collar to control them, but when the bunker's computer net went down, so did the ability to control them. Speck Washington and Sergeant Jones continued their search of the warehouse, finding several computers and boxes of files and pictures. Jack called in emergency medivacs to collect the casualties and asked Tammy to turn the lights back on. Nobody knew where Sovros was, but one thing was for sure. His empire was now in shambles, and his wealth had been decreased by over half. And hopefully, he would be investigated and prosecuted for possession of illegal biological material he had smuggled into the country. And two days later, at Fort Campbell, a huge party and farewell celebration was underway for Hawk and Chuck. The cadre drank and toasted the JTC founders. The two old friends embraced each other and loudly announced, This time, we really quit! And laughed out loud. The attendees cheered as a long overdue celebration raged. Epilogue. Heroes live on through the memories they create. Wow. Wow, 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 wow. Suddenly another one. Wow. From start to finish, this entire series has been nothing but heart-stopping, emotionally thrilling, and really quite epic. I want to give a mighty thank you to the incredible author, Rico, for choosing this channel to bring his incredible work to each and every one of you at home listening. I feel very honoured, Rico, for you approaching me and giving me the exclusive rights to narrate this incredible work on the show. And I really do hope you've enjoyed this process as much as I and I cannot wait to dive into your sci-fi adventures. I hope you and your family are well, and look forward to the next one. Well, guys and girls, as ever, you know the drill. Please do let us know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share. My head really does help build the channel and our community further. And why not hashtag Team Fear and DMT's Critted Crew. Now, if you think you can keep up with the standard that's become on this channel, or just want to have a crack of things like myself, then please do get in touch with me with the contact email, which is as on screen. Contact the dead one at gmail.com. I really look forward to hearing from you. As ever, guys and girls, I hope you're all well and happy, your family and friends alike, and you're making the most of the beautiful summer sunshine and days out exploring the wild wilderness. Most of all, I hope life is treating you well and you're staying fit and focused. But above all, guys, remember, 
be safe. Not sorry.